Why don't you pray with me, please? Gracious God and Heavenly Father, there is much to be thankful for. And our tendency is to look at what we have, what is in our grasp or what's been in our past and to say thank you, Lord God. Thanking, acknowledging the giver for what he has given us. But Lord God, we so often fail to acknowledge you, Lord God, that you are the greatest gift and that you are the reason for our existence, the reason that anything has any meaning whatsoever. And so God, we give you praise, we give you thanks and gratitude, not for anything that you have given us, but simply for yourself. We love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Excited to be here with y'all today. You'll have to forgive me. Uh, I've been fighting a losing battle with losing my voice this week. Uh, so if I just all of a sudden wind up sounding like I'm back in middle school, uh, please forgive me and we'll just press on together. We're wrapping up a series today uh, called Better Together and uh, I'm excited uh, to share with you today about one of the biggest components about being together is unity, right? Part of being better together is unity. It's kind of written into the, the concept of being uh, together. And one of the, the things that we talked about last week was this idea that we want to be a church that, that teaches and leads the generations to love Jesus. And if we're going to do that, we're going to have to do that in a unified way. We can't teach generations. That implies large scope, large scale. We can't do that unless we do it together, unless we're unified. I find unity to be a challenging thing. Not that it doesn't exist, uh, Jesus died to make us whole spiritually, metaphysically. We are unified in Christ. That is a reality. That's a fact. We don't have to strive for unity. It exists. We are unified in Christ. The problem is experiencing it practically. What does that look like? And that winds up being quite the puzzle. I got this off the internet where you can find pretty much anything nowadays. Um, it's called a puzzle box. It wasn't exactly what I was looking for, but it wound up being pretty cool. Uh, it makes different Geometric shapes, look at this. Stocking stuffer, 25 bucks on Amazon, there you go. Very easy, kids will be busy for all of five to seven minutes, and buy you all the time you need. But I find unity to be a lot like this puzzle box. We don't really know what to do with it. Uh, it it's, it's unified, but each time we mess with it, it looks different, and each shape kind of takes on a new form, you've got this thing, whatever that is, and it seems kind of limp and loose, and sometimes it looks really great, they don't all look the same. Unity is a puzzle, and it's difficult to figure out, and one of the things that, that it, it, it said on the box was, uh, if you force it, like it, it's not supposed to move that way. So it's supposed to move pretty naturally, but a lot of times we have a hard time getting it to go back to the shape that we think it should be. Unity is difficult to experience. It's, use, it's difficult to practically put into place. So I want us to talk today about what we can do, how we can be uh, experience, rather, that unity. We're in Romans 12, verses 1 through 8, and we're going to be looking at unity in worship, unity in thought, and unity in service. So let's talk about being unified in worship. Verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. I have very fond memories of this passage uh, because one of the first people uh, to teach me the importance of digging into the biblical text was my college minister named Bubba Rainwater. And Bubba taught me that when you come upon a therefore, one of the first things you have to ask is, what's the therefore? Therefore. See, all y'all are so smart. I'm so proud. What's it there for? Now, this is one of the most important therefores in all of Scripture because it is carrying the freight of the entire chapters 1 through 11 in Romans. Everything that Paul has said in the letter to the Romans is being covered. It's being supported by this therefore. So if you want to know, okay, what are we supposed to do in response to what Paul has said for the first 11 chapters, Paul's about to tell you, but it goes deeper than that because if you know what Paul talks about in chapters 1 through 11, you know he covers pretty much everything in the Bible. Every concept, every idea, creation, fall, redemption, restoration, it's all in chapters 1 through 11. 
Israel's place, their role, all this stuff is there. And so this therefore then isn't just what do we do in response to chapters one through 11. This is what do we do in response to God revealing himself to us? What do we do in response to the fact that our God loved us enough to send his son to die for us? What do we do? And Paul says, therefore, you offer your life in unified worship to God. There's one response and everybody has it. It doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter your language, your skin color, whatever, there's one response, worship. And it should be no surprise that if we are fractured in our worship, we'd be fractured in everything else because worship is so foundational. If we cannot get our response to God together, we won't get much else together either. So let's talk about three facets of worship that we find in this passage that can be unified. One, it's in our offering. It's in our offering. It's united in what we offer. Again, go back to verse one. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. <clears throat> Animal sacrifices in that day and age, in the ancient world, whether you were Jew, whether you were Gentile, didn't matter. You would have had a very visual uh, a sort of sensory experience of animal sacrifice. We think of it conceptually. People don't really do animal sacrifices anymore. I'm, I don't know of any that you could attend, which is probably good. But back in that day, it would have been a common core theme. You would have been able to smell the smells of the altar. You would have heard the death cries of the animals as they were slaughtered on the altar. You would have seen the blood pouring off. You've seen the carcasses hauled off the altar while the next one came up for sacrifice. You would have known and experienced this in a sensory sense. And on top of that, you would have also known that typically you didn't bring a living sacrifice. What I mean by that is you didn't offer part of the animal. If the animal went up there, it wasn't coming back alive. You didn't go up there with your sheep and be like, hey, I really need this sheep. Can you just like take an ear and call it good? Like, let's just lob off an ear and move on. Or, hey, I got this pig. Can you just get the tail? Doesn't really need it anyway. It's kind of superfluous. Let's just go back. There was no concept of a living sacrifice. If it went up there, it died. But Paul here is talking about being a living sacrifice. What does that mean? What does that mean? Paul is saying what every single person in the church, when they respond to God's great love, what we need to be united in is this idea of what Douglas Moo, who's a, a commentator on Romans, says, God is not interested in the gift as much as he is interested in the giver. He's interested in the giver. He wants the person. Psalm 51, David says this. He says the, the sacrifices that God desires is a contrite heart, is a repentant heart heart. God desires all of us. There's a great movie from 1992 called Unforgiven with Clint Eastwood. He actually won an uh, Oscar, I think, for a director uh, for this movie. And in it, he's kind of this older uh, cowboy, uh, outlaw, bad guy who gets sucked back into being uh, kind of a bad guy. And he's not very good at it at first, and then he, he kind of figures it out again. Long story short, at the very end of the movie, he's having a conversation with a younger cowboy about taking somebody's life. And he says, it's a funny thing killing a man. You take everything he has and everything he's ever gonna have. And when we go to worship God, when we bring ourselves as a living sacrifice to the altar of the Lord, that is what we offer. Everything we have and everything we're gonna have. That's the ask. And it's not to justify you. It's not to make you righteous before God. It's not to make God like you better. It is a response to his love for us, everything we have and everything we're gonna have. And this shows you where we begin to become fractured because there are very few people, and I mean very few people, who give 100% everything that they have and everything they're gonna have. And some of us give 75, some of us give 50, some of us give 25, and what it looks like is this. It looks like me saying, well, I'm gonna be a good follower of Jesus I'm gonna, uh, on Sunday mornings and maybe at a Bible study, but after that, I'm a free agent. I'm gonna live my life the way I want. 
or I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a, a good parent, I'm gonna live righteously at home, but at work, I gotta, I gotta get that bread, so I'm gonna go for it. I'm gonna do whatever I'm gonna do. Or maybe you wanna show yourself to be well thought of, and so you try to follow Christ when other people are watching, but when you're home, you're a different person altogether. This creates fracture in our worship. Shows that we are not practically unified because we're not all giving the same. We're not all at the altar saying, Lord Jesus, take everything I have and everything I'm gonna have. And it's hard. It's hard to give everything you have and everything you're gonna have. Our temptation is to not do that. Our temptation is to not do that because here's the problem with being a living sacrifice. You crawl off the altar. An animal that's dead stays there. It can't move. But a living sacrifice, we put ourselves up there. We have a good day at church or a good time with the Lord and we say, I'm gonna give you everything I got and everything I'm gonna have, Lord. And then the next day you're like, well, maybe not. And we crawl back down off the altar. And this is a puzzle. How do we solve this? How do we solve this problem of worship that I do not respond to my creator the way that he desires me to respond? You see, there's some missing pieces. There's a big hole in ourselves, kind of like right here in the middle. And we, we work with it, we try to force it, we try to make ourselves into something that is acceptable to God. And we can't seem to get it right. And this is where Jesus comes in. The son of God, who is a living sacrifice, and he went up on the cross, and he was taunted. He was teased. They were like, hey, you could save everybody else. Why can't you save yourself? Hey, why don't you come down off that cross? You'll, we'll believe you're the Messiah if you can do that. And I'll be honest, if that were me, I would have crawled down and I would have showed him exactly what I was talking about. But see, Jesus is a living sacrifice that doesn't crawl off the altar, and that tells us something about him. He has the missing pieces we're looking for. We try to twist, like I said, sometimes this, this puzzle came with an instruction that said, don't force it, right? We're always trying to force ourselves into certain shapes to be the person that people think we should be, to try and be the person that God, we think God wants us to be. And instead, God says, come to me, all you who are weary, and I'm gonna make you right. I'm gonna make you the shape that I want you to be. I'm gonna make you look exactly the way you need to look. But all you have to do is come to me in faith and trust that I have the missing pieces you're looking for. So stop trying to rummage around in the box that is your life and trying to figure out how to be unified, to be whole on your own. Jesus has the missing pieces and he wants to give them to you. Just put your faith and trust in him. In whatever way you know how to do that, put your trust in him. And then respond to him as a living sacrifice. So we're unified in what we offer. We're also unified in our focus. He says to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. We're often holy and acceptable. The words holy and acceptable means set apart and approved of. So it's set apart for God's worship and approved of. Oftentimes, we're not looking to be set apart and approved of by God. Oftentimes, we're looking to be set apart and approved of by our jobs, by ourselves, by our family. You're gonna be having dinner this week, probably with some family members. Some of us are grown adults, and we're still looking for mom or dad to approve of us. Our mom and dad are like 95, and we're still looking for mom to like our green bean casserole. She's not gonna do it, y'all, just give it up. It's not as good as hers, she knows it. Just let it go. We set ourselves apart, we set ourselves apart for a job and we give everything we can to it and the moment that we're unappreciated, the moment that we're treated less, we're like looking for another job. Well, I'm gonna go take my talent somewhere else. I'm gonna go somewhere else where they appreciate me. Or if I can lay my head down at night and know that I, was, I did a good job or I, I did what I was supposed to do, or if I can, I'm happy with who I am, that I'm set apart and approved. And it should be no wonder that we are fractured in our worship because we're all off worshiping different gods. Some of us worship the God of work. Some of us worship the God of family. Some of us worship the God of relationships. Some of us worship the God of ourselves. 
Christianity is not a polytheistic religion, but yet we function as if Jesus is one of many people in a pantheon of gods. Jesus does not want to be a part of your pantheon. He wants to be your pantheon. He doesn't want to be added to your collection. And until he is solely the person we worship, solely our focus, your practical experience of worship will not be unified. It will be divided and fractured. So you have to ask yourself every day, what am I, who am I worshiping? Whose approval really am I seeking? Whose affirmation do I want? And if the answer is genuinely anybody other than Christ, you confess, you repent, and you focus on him. And he's gracious to forgive. He understands how difficult it is. This world is a distracting place, maybe more distracting than it's ever been. It's hard to keep our focus on Christ. And he's gracious to forgive us because he's lived here. He knows what it's like. And he never failed to focus on the Father. But he is understanding to us who have. So we need to be unified in our focus, unified in what we offer. We also need to be unified in our location. In our location, look at the end of verse one, which is your spiritual worship. So in the ancient world, if you were gonna go worship someplace, you had to go to a temple. You went to like a place where this God was honored. And again, Douglas Moo talks about how unique it was for Christianity to have a place where their Messiah, our God, was killed and then our God was raised from the dead and it took them forever to ever build any kind of a building or temple on those spots. Nowadays, there are churches on those places, but originally for like the first 200 years, there were no churches there. Why? Because of what Jesus says. What does Jesus tell his disciples to do? Follow me. Follow me. This, is, this concept is not sedentary. People didn't, uh, Jesus wants you to follow him wherever he is going. You think it's interesting that Jesus never says, follow me to Rome, follow me to Washington, D.C., follow me to Krispy Kreme? That is one yes that would be very easy to the Lord. Yes, Lord, I will go there with you to the Krispy Kreme, to the glory of God. Why does he not give us a place? Because the point isn't where Jesus is going. It's that he is going. The place of worship is at the feet of Jesus, wherever that is. Wherever that may be. We're still following Jesus all over the world. By the end of my lifetime, we very well could be following Jesus all over the solar system. You have a church on the moon and Mars, who knows? God willing. Wherever you go, that is a place of worship. Whenever you uh, refuse to respond with anything less than a kind word, and not because like, oh, I don't wanna get in trouble at work, or oh, I just don't want a oh, conflict, but because Christ Jesus forgave you and loves you, and you respond with a kind word instead of a harsh one, that is a sacrifice to the Lord, holy and pleasing to him. When you forgive someone that probably doesn't deserve it, but you do it because Christ forgave you because we don't deserve it. That is a spiritual act of worship, holy and pleasing to God. And the ground that you do it on becomes consecrated. Whenever we extend grace, whenever we apologize for something, whenever we love, whenever we give, whenever we proclaim Christ because of Christ, that is a spiritual act of worship, holy and pleasing to God. To be unified we have to be unified in our worship. It's foundational, it's core. And Jesus died to bring about unity. If you wonder why you still feel broken, still disjointed despite all that you've tried, all that you've experienced, all that you've explored, and you wonder why you still feel broken, you feel, still feel not put together, it may be that Jesus Christ has not given you the missing pieces that you're looking for. You can do that today. You can turn to him today. Say, Lord Jesus, please, I want to be whole. I'm looking at the, the box cover of my life, and it was supposed to look like one thing, just like a puzzle, you know, when you get a puzzle and it's got the pretty picture on the box? And you're like, that's what my puzzle's supposed to look like, and then you look at the puzzle you have, and you're like, clearly I don't have all the pieces. Some of us are like that. You know what it's supposed to look like, but you don't look like that. And Jesus says, I've got the missing pieces you're looking for. Let me put them let me put them in place. You can do that today. You don't have to wait. Be the greatest Thanksgiving you've ever had because you can turn to Christ and truly be thankful to the one that you now know 
rather than the one you've just heard about. So we have unity in our worship. We also have unity in thought. Look at verse two. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So I think this is a fascinating comparison between conformity and transformation. They seem to be very similar ideas. The difference is, one of the differences anyway, is in the voice. So conform is in the middle passive, meaning you can be conformed by an outside force, but you can also conform yourself, right? You can conform yourself. Culture is a construct that desires conformity. That's what culture wants. That's the goal of culture. It's not a bad thing. We think it is, but it's not necessarily. All of you are conformed to culture. Not one of you in here is running around naked because you have conformed to culture, praise God. You will probably go and eat a meal after this because you've conformed to culture. After church, we hustle over to a restaurant to beat the Methodist to the restaurant. We are conformed to culture. Hopefully all of you drove on the right side of the road to get here. You are conformed to culture. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Culture desires conformity. It's important. But sometimes we break with culture, right? And sometimes it's cute, like it's an amusing thing. So they say that you might march to the beat of a different drummer. Oh, it's cute. But sometimes breaking with culture is full on deviance and you're arrested and imprisoned for it. Culture desires conformity. It brings about stability. But God does not desire conformity of us. He desires transformation. And it's purely passive. It's not a middle thing. We don't transform ourselves. The Holy Spirit, when we accept Christ, comes into our heart and makes us a new creation. And we begin to be transformed. But whether you're being conformed or transformed, you are being given a worldview. A worldview. Let me explain what I mean by worldview. I have a worldview. Very guilty of having a worldview. I have a worldview that Coca-Cola is the greatest liquid ever given to human beings. It's the greatest beverage company of all time. And I have a reason for this. I've been conformed from a very small age that this is the truth. I grew up in Marietta, Georgia, a suburb of Atlanta, which is the birthplace of Coca-Cola. My father worked for decades at Coca-Cola. So for us to drink anything other than water and Coca-Cola was to put, take food off of our tables and put it on some godless Pepsi p- family. <laughs> we couldn't do it. We would go to restaurants and if they didn't serve Pepsi, we would never go back. Or if they didn't serve Coke, we would never go back. And if we went to a restaurant that we loved and they switched to Pepsi, we would never go back. These are not lies, these are not, this is truth. To this day, I walk into a restaurant and I'm like, do they serve Coke? And if they do not, there is a small part of me that's like, "Mm, dad's disappointed in me. (laughs) They'll ask me, I'll say, I'd like a Diet Coke. Is a Diet Pepsi okay? And I want to always, I don't say this, but I want to say, is Monopoly money okay? (laughs) Can I pay with that, please? This is because I have been conformed to a worldview. See, you have an opinion about beverages. You probably have a favorite beverage, but you probably won't stop going to a restaurant if they don't serve it. That's because you have an opinion. An opinion is a thought. A worldview is a thought that now affects your action. A thought that affects action. And Christ, through his transformation of us, wants to give us a new worldview that affects, an opinion that affects our action, but so many of us are shaped and conformed to other ideas. Our worldview is shaped by politics. Our worldview is shaped by denomination, by our skin color, by our education, by our ethnicity, what school you went to. We allow things like news agencies, podcasts, radio stations, speakers, music, clubs, associations, books to shape our worldview, and none of this is the transformation that Christ desires of us. It's no surprise that we're not unified in our thinking. All of us are being taught to think differently by different sources. And again, I'm not talking about being a mindless zombie here. Christ very much wants us to think. That's why he wants us to renew our minds. He says it here. Look what he says at the end of the the verse. 
Renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The Bible does not have every single specific thing that we should ever do. There's, the Bible doesn't have the internet in it. We have to discern what God desires us to do with the internet. Jesus didn't have a Facebook page. We have to discern what to do with that. What is good, what is pleasing, what is perfect. And the way that we do this is by being transformed. And the way you're transformed is by spending time with the things that the Lord uses to change us. His word, prayer, his people, the spirit of God. All these things work together. Now, I've heard a long time in my life, like, oh, well, you're, you're spending X number of hours being conformed by the world. You should spend a lot of time with the Lord. And yes, you should spend time with the Lord, a lot of it, if you can. But I fully believe that my God is powerful enough to transform me over 15 minutes versus eight hours or whatever I give to everything else. Now, this doesn't mean that, again, you don't spend time with the Lord. You do work to increase your time with the Lord. But not because you have to, but because you want to. Because your love for him has grown in the time that he's transformed your heart, that the other things don't seem as exciting because your time with the Lord is better. But if you wake up and you're like, man, I'm super late, I've got five minutes to give to the Lord, don't be like, well, that's not good enough. Then the Lord says, hey, give me five minutes. <clears throat> One of the worst things we've ever done is to put a time limit on how long our time with the Lord should be. I mean, imagine spending a date night with my wife and being like, well, honey, we've hit the requisite hour. You may go and do your thing, I'm going to go and do mine and I'll have a Diet Coke while I do it. <laughs> Imagine the romance that we would share in that, that marriage. Stop putting a time limit on your time with the Lord. Give him what you can. If a little boy showed up one day with five loaves and two fish and he fed a multitude, why do you think the Lord can't transform you with five minutes in the morning? Got to put some faith in our God. Got to put some faith in him. And this is going to create unity in our thinking. Because now we're more concerned with what God wants than what everybody else wants. I want you to try something this week. Because you're going to be at a dinner table, a lunch table, with people that you may disagree with. I know. I know that's shocking to hear at Thanksgiving. But it's true. <laughs> you will be around people that you don't agree with. I want you to do this. When you enter into that conflict, whatever it may be, whether it's Thanksgiving, whether it's something else, maybe it's just deciding where to go to have lunch today, I want you to stop, I want you to pray. Not that God would change their minds and not that God would even change your mind, but that God would reveal to both of you what is his will, it's good, pleasing, and perfect will. And then I want you to do something really, really difficult. I don't want you to move forward until you both agree on what you should do. That's unity in thought. It's trusting the Lord to give us his direction rather than some kind of a compromise together that nobody's happy with. Compromise is fine. There's nothing wrong with compromise. But what if there's a third way that the Lord has for us that he wants to show us if we would just stop arguing for five seconds and turn to him and say, Lord Jesus, what do you want? And give us the strength and the courage to do that rather than to compromise. We need to have unity in our offering. We need to have unity, excuse me, unity in our worship, unity in our thought, and unity in our service. Look at verse three. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another." Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in his generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So one of the easiest ways to solve this puzzle is to just rip it apart. Not listen to the designer and say, hey, you know what? I can make all sorts of shapes with it if I just take the individual pieces and make them do whatever I want with it. And that's one way to solve it, it's a shortcut. But you see, that's not the designer's intention for this little 
and gizmo that I have here. The designer's intention is that you work within the constraints he's given you. And the designer of, our, of ourselves and of the church, Jesus Christ, has ordained that we should do Christian life together. Christianity is a communal relationship. It's a communal faith. It's not meant to be lived alone. It's meant to be lived in fellowship with other believers. And a lot of us, our solution to disunity in the church is to like, well, you go do your thing, we'll go do our thing, and everything will be great. No, that's not what God desires. God desires that we be together, that we be together. And some of us also think, well, Christianity is a, is a personal faith, and so I'm just gonna keep my relationship with the Lord private. You've made a, a fundamental error in confusing the word personal with private. A personal relationship with Jesus does not mean a private one. Your relationship with Jesus is supposed to be open to other believers so that they may speak into it. You see, transformation happens by the Spirit of God working through his people. That's why we're different members of one body. Different members of one body rather than all being individual bodies. And so he's given us different gifts. This is why he's given us different gifts. So that we can build up one another, so we can uh, experience unity in a practical sense. And this really tells us two things, these different gifts. I'm not gonna get into all of them. But one, everybody has a gift to offer. Every single one of you has something to offer the body of Christ. And the body of Christ suffers when you don't offer it. And if I'm honest with you, I don't suffer nearly as much as the person, or, or we don't suffer nearly as much as the person who doesn't offer. Because we don't know what we're missing. But you do. You're missing out on giving to the church in a way that's unique and special to you. But unity is also fostered by giving the gifts. Unity practically is experienced when we give our gifts, when we're all pulling together, because none of us can do it. Remember, we want to reach the generations. We want to lead the generations to love Jesus. My one gift can't do that. And I really do genuinely believe I have one gift, and it's teaching. And some of y'all are sitting there being like, Travis, you may not have that gift, and I'd like to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> and that's okay. I will accept it with humility, because I'm not going to think more highly of myself than I ought. That's what the passage says. Please be nice. But my one gift, despite our love of celebrity preaching and celebrity pastors and celebrities in general, a celebrity one individual cannot reach the generations. It's going to take all of us, every single one, using the gifts that God has given each of us. It's a lofty goal, but God has given us lofty gifts to use for his glory. And so you might ask questions. You might say, well, Travis, what, do I, what, what is my gift? How can I know? Ask somebody. I can ask my wife right now, honey, I think I have the gift of administration. And she will say, I kid you not, who are you and what have you done with my husband? And do not have the gift of administration. Your family, your friends, other believers will know what your gifting is. And then ask yourself this question. Where can this gift be used at the church? Some of our gifts can be used to be quite lucrative. How can the gift you have be used to build up the church in general. And then third question, how can it be used here at Park Cities locally? And these are all questions I would love to help you answer. That's why we have ministers here to help you answer these questions. We got about seven weeks to the, to the end of the year, I think. Is that right? Six, seven weeks? I said seven in the last service because seven's a perfect number in the Bible. So we're just gonna go with seven. You got about seven weeks to figure out these three questions. I want you to spend the next seven weeks asking yourself, what's my gift? How can the church use it generally and how the church can use it specifically? And when January 2nd rolls around, which is the first Sunday of 2022, you're ready to serve. And I understand some of you may still be on vacation. You've got till January 9th. But that's as far as I'm going. You, you, you drove a hard bargain, good negotiating. What are you good at? What has God gifted you with? And what are you holding on to that the church could benefit from? What could we benefit from? So that we might be unified in our worship of God, unified in the way that we think, and unified in our service. Let's pray together. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, you have given us the answers to the puzzle. And Lord Jesus, it's you. 
You're the one who holds those missing pieces, whatever they might be, and I pray that we would hand over the puzzle that is our lives to you, that you would lead us in solving it. Lord, I pray that we'd be unified, practically speaking, in our worship of you, and our love for you, in the way that we think. And Lord God, I pray that we would unify in service to bring glory to God and the gospel to the nations. It's in your name we pray, amen.